Hey guys, today I'm sitting down with Mike Plachter, CPA and real estate investor. Uh, Mike is a good friend of mine who I met through a local RIA. He is a great guy, excellent resource, and just always looking to help. Now, we're not going to drill down the tax code. We're going to talk a lot about depreciation, uh, different deductions, different legal entities. Uh, we're also going to talk about Mike's business and what he does to find deals. So uh, welcome, Mike, and uh, thanks for joining today. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate having me on again. Yeah. So let's just start off just, you know, just telling everybody a little about yourself, kind of your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Um, Mike Plachter, CPA. Uh, I'm an accountant, uh, but, you know, my, my day job and I'm also a real estate investor as well. Um, you want to hear a little bit about like my story or? Yeah. Like, yeah, I guess we can you know, in, in high school, did you know you wanted to be an accountant or was that not the. No. No, it's funny because I actually wanted to be in finance. Um, you know, I graduated in 2006 in high school, so I went to, to college. Didn't start taking like my major courses until probably 2008. So I wanted to be a finance major. And 2008, the stock market crashed. It was like the worst crash we've ever seen. And, you know, you have to be a genius to put two and two together and just be like, well, you're probably not going to get a job in finance in two years when I graduate college. Uh, so at that same time, though, I was taking my first accounting course um, because you have to take, you know, finance, accounting, marketing, and take all the, the business courses if you're a business major. So uh, <clears throat> that was the first, um, that fall semester was the first time I ever took accounting. Didn't even know what accounting was really. And um, I really liked it. Like everyone, like all my lacrosse buddies, like struggled. Everyone was struggling. They didn't understand accounting. It was so like foreign to them. But to me, it was like not that hard. And I was doing pretty well. And also knew at the time, like accounting is not an industry that's not as cyclical as like real, um, as real estate or um, even like finance, right? So I knew I could get a job out of college and it wouldn't have been like, it was definitely a hard job market. I'm not going to lie when I, when I exited college because we were like in a great recession, but um, it was, I certainly got a job right out of college and uh, you know, uh, it was just easier to find a job in that field versus other fields. So, yeah. You know, I picked accounting. I really liked it, and I excelled at it. And um, yeah, just, I got a job working at like a small firm uh, right out of college, and that's kind of you know I learned a lot. It was a great job, and that's when I kind of learned real estate too, because I, I didn't at the time know um, being a real estate investor is a thing. Like we didn't have like YouTube like the way we do now, where it's like you know there's all these videos on becoming a real estate investor, and I didn't know about like Rich Dad Poor Dad or any of those books, so. Um, yeah, just I got a job working for a lot of the high net worth clients that our firm had, and I realized they all had one thing in common, and it was real estate investments. They had whether it was like an office building, a strip mall, a mall, um, any whatever industrial. Um, a lot of them had real estate investments, or I say all of them did. Uh, so whether they you know made their wealth in some other field or whatever, or in real estate. They all had one thing in common. It was that, that's the way to preserve wealth. I realized was through real estate. Um, you know, so then I go down that rabbit hole. You know, YouTube University. You know, I read a bunch of books about it, and then I was just kind of like hooked. I thought it was great. It was such a really cool thing to own like rental properties. So, you know, that's essentially what I did. Uh, spent years and years and years like self educating, and then I met some. I met Ralph Rivera actually through a family friend. Ralph's. Uh, part of the, the, the RIA that we're in together. And he introduced me to East Coast RIA. Like, I had no idea what it was. Uh, he's like, listen, if you're serious about this thing, you might want to come to the East Coast RIA, meet Carl, who was our mentor, and uh, just sort of learn the business from him and, you know, network and meet people and stuff like that. So, yeah, I attended the, uh, the RIA for like two years and COVID hit. And, you know, when COVID hit, it kind of changed everything, you know, like, I was because listen for like the longest time I was just sitting on the sidelines, not really doing anything to, uh, to expand my business. And um, when COVID hit, I was working from home, so it made things a lot a lot easy, like you know, a lot easier to kind of like work on the business. Um, and that with my daughter being born, like I don't know what it was, but like something just sparked in me to like, you got to start taking action. Enough is enough. Like because I was sitting on the sidelines forever. Uh, wanting to get into the game and not really taking the action. And that's the biggest key. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, two years later, I got my first rental property. And uh, nice. I'm nice. doing podcasts left and right. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so there was a bunch of stuff in there that I, you know, I kind of want to unpack. But uh, I didn't know Ralph introduced you to the Ria. Yeah, um, it's funny. His so my wife's uncle, his best friend is Ralph Rivera. They grew up together with the high school. They, went, they grew up as like kids together in North Babylon. And, um, that I, you know, we would always me and my her uncle would always like go out and we'd have like dinner and drinks and we'd always just talk and bullshit. And, um, I was just like, you know, tell him one night, like, I'm really serious about this thing. I want to get into real estate. It's one of my passions. I, tr I truly like, I love it. And he's like, well, listen, like, you know, my buddy Ralph, he flips, you know, however many homes a year and he's got a few rental properties. And he was like explaining to me all his deals and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, I'd love to meet this guy. So we set up like a dinner um, where it's just me, my her uncle uh, and, and Ralph. And that's when he, you know, we sat down and he's like, listen, if you're serious about this, come to the RIA, uh, meet Carl and um, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. Nice. Did you, did you get to go to any in-person uh, RIAs? Yeah. Yeah. I, I went, this is probably like either the end of 2018 or probably, no, no, no. It was probably the beginning of 2019. So I went to a bunch of them in 2019 and yeah, I would say I went to like most of them in 2019 and then in 2020, January and February, I went to those and then it was, February was a weird one. Cause it was like, well, we don't know this COVID thing and they canceled March as you know, and then we haven't been in person since. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, um, as you know, I also coach with uh, with Carl. He's my mentor. And um, I guess I signed up with him right before COVID then because I made it to one in-person Ria at that Italian okay. place. Yeah. Yeah. And then after yeah, that, and then after that, it went it went to Zoom. Yes. Yeah. So you, we might have either crossed paths or I, might, I think I missed one of them in the fall. Um, it could have been you went to that one. We just missed each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Maybe, maybe you, maybe you're at my table. I don't even remember, but. <laughs> How did you, yeah, it could have been. How did you, uh, get like involved with the RIA though? I just, um, so I was an iron worker in the city and yeah. I knew I wanted to get into real estate investing. My goal was to do it once I graduated apprenticeship school, which is three years being in the union. And, you know, during that time I got my real estate license. Uh, tons of books, tons, tons of podcasts. And then I finally made the jump and I wanted to coach. And it was just like a, actually a Google search that I found Carl. I gave him a call off his website. We had a brief conversation. And the whole time, you know, he's just giving me, you know, facts after facts. And he even emailed me a follow up after everything we spoke about, uh, next steps to take with, uh, small business, um, section eight, things like that. And I'm just waiting the whole time for him to sell me on something, you know, never did, but I knew he was a coach because that's why I called him and I saw his website. And then, um, I followed up with him and said, yeah, I, you know, I'd like to, like to join this Rio and this program. And that, that's how I really got started. It's been great. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's what I like about him. He's not like sales. He's not like a salesy guy at all. No, you know? no. I, yeah, I can't stand uh, a lot of these. A lot of these RIAs are like sales pitches for some guy, you know, doing, you know, coaching or whatever. And he mm -hmm. does coaching, but he doesn't, he's, he's like, listen, like he's not going to pitch you on it. And, um, and actually if you go into these meetings, like pitching people on like business ideas and shit, like he'll kick you out of the group. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And he, you can tell he does it because he, he loves it. He loves the idea of giving back and coaching and, you know, teaching guys like us because he's, he's been investing, you know, in what, what we want to invest in for the past like 40 years, you know, rental section, eight, yeah. all, all things like that. So he's been there, but done it, that. It keeps it like authentic. You know, this, what is this really about? This is about real estate. This isn't about some, uh, you know, uh, internet router scheme that you got or some business multi-level market. It's like, no, the, the, you know, we're not doing pitches here, sales pitches here. Like this is about real estate. So yeah. I like that. It keeps it, it keeps the conversation talking about real estate, nothing else. Yeah, me too. And you just get a bunch of all real people, you know, you, you, yeah. get to, you get to actually meet who they are on a personal level. And it's nice. Absolutely. That's how we met. You know, we just met the, in the Rio. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you invited me out to one of your properties and stuff. And yeah, we just kind of like just been uh, 
Yeah, just yeah, back and forth. Yeah, relationship a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So before we get into all the tax stuff, um, I know you recently got your first rental. Um, looks like it's going great. So I just want to jump into that a little bit. Um, you know, just a quick rundown on, you know, how you got the deal, any uh, trouble, um, renovations, closing, um, you know, tenants, dealing with Section A, things like that. Yeah, no, I got the deal. It's, uh, the property's in Bellport, as you know. And I got the deal through a realtor. Um, I think I might have sent them, like, I think I sent them, like, a video text uh, a while back, like, like, over a year ago. And I think she responded. She had some deal, and, you know, and, uh, you know, it didn't work out, that deal. And I just kept, like, building a relationship with her. You know, because she, she does um, mainly stuff out in the areas that we're both investing in. So I knew, like, all right, she's um i definitely want to keep in good graces with her you know yeah so she sent me a couple deals and you know it, it didn't really work out between between us and um you know i was close on one and then ultimately you know the property needed way too much work so i i couldn't you know uh, take that deal but anyway she's like listen there's a property i know the homeowner wants to sell um you know her her tenants moving out uh, she doesn't want to renovate the property. She doesn't, she doesn't know anything about construction. Her husband died, and she just wants to sell it. So I was like, okay, uh, you know, let me let me take a look at it and see if I can make it work. You know, show me the numbers and everything like that. And I, I, you know, I went out there, got inspected with Mike Tatino, and it didn't need like a ton of work. Like it needed some cosmetic stuff, kitchen and bathroom, uh, floors, paint, and. And that's pretty much it. And, and so I was like, you know, the numbers made sense at what they're asking. Um, so we were able to move forward and it was a good deal. You know, it's a good deal. I have like, you know, after renovation, I have like 40, 45,000 in equity and it's making me money. And that's the biggest component right there is the, the equity. Yeah. You know? Nice. Yeah. And I, I, cash flow is great, but I, it's the equity that's important. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, it's whatever, it's a preference what everybody wants, you know, cash flow, equity, it's, you know, but I like a, a nice mix of both, but I'm, I'm all about the equity yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, Carl taught us this. I mean, I, I would, I used to be like, no cash flow, you know, you have the cash flow, but it's like, you know, it's not very smart. You know, what if there's a, you have no exit strategy, you have <laughs> no exit strategy. Your exit strategy is hope the market keeps going up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> if, yeah, if anything happens, you could sell your house tomorrow, pay off the mortgage and profit a little bit. Right. And people just don't, they don't, they see, they see equity as like, it's, it, it's unrealized gains. You know, they look at it like, well, I don't get to see that money. So why I'm not, they don't value it, but yeah. you should value it <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. it's important. Like you can always refinance and get the money, you know, uh, you could always sell it one day and get the money. Mm -hmm. um, it just gives you options. It's an insurance policy. Exactly. Yeah, it's huge. You can refinance it. You can leverage against the property to buy another property or, you know, whatever. And that, that property is going to appreciate every every single year, you know? Yeah, exactly. 100%. Yeah. And I, I've been to the, the belt, your Bellport house. It's nice. And, uh, Thanks, and, and all the work you did. Thank you. Yeah, so, no, it's, it's exciting. So you did, you did the floors, you did the kitchen, you did the bathroom. Um, and some other things. So how, how was it like dealing with contractors and, you know, wrangling them all well, them up and things like that? Well, you remember how bad it stunk of cigarettes. I don't know if you came in. Did you come in the beginning? It yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Just walking in, I felt like I needed a mask or something. Yeah. Like punch in the face. Uh, so we, we got rid of that. That was big, but that was like another one. We, we didn't know how to get rid of it. Cause it, we would put the, the kills on and all that, all the, you know, we actually like vinegared the walls, like they did everything and it still stunk. So I put like tons and tons of coats on, but it, it, we got rid of it. Wow. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. No, deal with, deal with contracts is a tough, um, you know, you know, uh, the contract I worked with is pretty good. Um, you know, we had some issues here and there, but ultimately, you know, dealing with contracts is tough, man. Because they'll say like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll show up. Um, uh, then, then they don't show up or, um, you know, oh, there's a holiday that they, that we don't know about, you know, that they can't show up or, uh, oh, the siding, what, what did I get once? Uh, <laughs> they were supposed to put the siding on and then it was like, well, it's going to rain, so we can't do it. But then I'm like, as uh, two days before, it's like, it's not going to rain anymore. Can you do it? So you're not, and you don't hear from them. It's like, 
Yeah. You just got to like babysit the, it's really a lot of work to manage them. Yeah. Um, so finding the right contractor, I think is key. Uh, probably the most important thing, probably one of the hardest things in this business. Um, certainly finding a deal is, is very hard. Uh, but <clears throat> I've, I've seen that, you know, managing contractors can be just as, if not harder. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, on my first job, uh, it was a flip, and I, I think I went through five plumbers and just on one job. Oh, yeah, I was I was building my team on that job. It was my it was my first deal. Um, I went in with a carpenter and kind of just figure out the rest and bring people in after that. Um, my co- my carpenter was a rock star, so he uh, he's a great asset. Um, but everybody else, you know, it's definitely a lot of trial and error people not showing yeah. up, you know, things like, like I said, five plumbers, a couple of electricians, um, Jeez, things why, like that. Why so many plumbers, like they just didn't do the right job or they weren't showing up. Um, a little bit of both, you know, some plumbers, uh, didn't make it through the whole job. Um, one guy stopped showing up. Another guy just wasn't happy with the work. Um, so we cut it off with both of them. Um, I'd probably two more guys who just didn't didn't show up. Um, and I asked one guy if he does um, service contracts or if I call him in the winter, you know, for a, a burst pipe or something, can I count on him to go there? And he goes, um, oh, yeah, well, if I'm, if I'm not out at the bar or if I'm not out too late, you know, just give me a call, leave me a message. And I was like, okay, you know, this guy's not going <laughs> to. Yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And guys literally say that because that's that's just like the na- the nature of the business, you know. Yeah, I, I realize a lot of these guys are they're they're tradesmen, right? So a lot of them um, they're not great business people, you know. So like they, they might have been like um, a plumber or a carpenter, and then they're like, you know, I'm sick of working for the man, so they go out on their own. Yeah, um, but they don't realize like it's not as easy as it's as it seems. Like going out as your own your own boss, your businessman. Like there's a whole other component to managing staff and booking and getting business and, you know, staying true to your word with the client. Like there's a whole shit ton of stuff that they don't face with when they're the employee. So a lot of these guys can't run a business essentially is what I'm trying to say. And, yeah. and you know, you as the investor are trying to deal with that because let's be honest, we're not, we're not hiring, you know, the guy in the paper who, who they can come, they're going to charge you three times worth more than what their work is worth, but they're going to get the job done. And like, three days and it's going to be great. And it's like in and out, but we're not paying for that. You know what I mean? We, we can't have a business model that makes sense like that. So we're not, you know, we're dealing with those, like I said, those guys that in the trades that maybe they go out on their own and, you know, it makes sense to use them obviously numbers wise, but it's just hard to manage them. You yeah. Find a guy, it's easier to manage. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, that's, that's probably one of the toughest things of the business, you know, next to finding deals. Yeah, hundred percent. And, um, yeah. And then like, it's smart that you, what you said, as far as going into, uh, the job, you know, figuring out your, your, your team, uh, that's kind of what we're all doing. You know, we, we don't have, I mean, it's, it's it, we, I wish I had everything set up day one, but it's not, they're not the reality. Like a deal's going to fall in your lap and you know, you're gonna have to figure out the contracting side. Like you got a, a carpenter, which is smart. And then you figured out, like you built around it. And yeah. I think exactly. that's the way you got to go. Like that's kind of what you, what you got to do is get a contract, uh, a carpenter or something who could do a lot of work. They could do a shit ton of stuff. They could yeah. clean, they could sheet rock, they could paint. Um, and then you just find like the trades in between. And then ultimately when you find people you're comfortable with, what I found is, you know, once you find the, 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 com- the people you're comfortable with, then you got to build around more. Like you gotta, you gotta have, you know, contractor one, contractor two, contractor three, because you know, one, these guys are maybe maybe they can't fulfill your job, so you have to go to number two. Mm-hmm. Uh, but two, as you're scaling, you maybe the the first guy who you love, maybe if you give him a second job, he falls apart and he can't do it. So you got to have more than one one contractor, or or at least you have multiple trades or whatever. You just got to have a, a, a you know rolodex of contractors, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I still I, I keep track of everybody that I've used. I, whether good or bad, you know, I have it in a spreadsheet just, just so I know. Cause I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you who those plumbers were those years ago. 
but if I look it up, I, you know, I, I still have everything and the guys I did like and things like that. Yeah. hundred percent. I do that too. Like even people that come to my own house, like, like, um, this contractor subbed out an electrician, for the mud room I was doing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I really liked them. So I kept this information and they did a great job. They were fast. And I think I might use them like at my business. If, if, uh, if I need an electrician that needs to be licensed or whatever it may be. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's a great way to define them too. Yeah. Uh, dude, I've used so many guys in my house, which it, it's kind of a tricky thing. You might not want to do it. Uh, because you know, your wife might not like that. You know, if you're using like cheap guys who are not good, I used one guy left a mess everywhere. Uh, and, um, you know, my wife wasn't too happy, but, uh, he did good work. It's just like, this is messy. Just messy. Um, yeah. So, however, that being said, like I've used guys in my house and knock on wood so far, a lot of them have been pretty good and I'll, I'll use them in my business as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you, you, we renovated the property and then you got the rental permit or you probably started the rental permit before that, but how, you know, this is a uh, town of Brookhaven. So how was dealing with the town of Brookhaven for inspections, rental permit, thing like, things like that? Um, actually it was actually pretty smooth. Like from what I've heard, I've heard horror stories. I've heard people waiting, uh, you know, 12 weeks plus just to get a rental permit. And <clears throat> that, I mean, that's crazy, but the situation that we were, I don't, maybe I was in a special situation, but we actually picked out a tenant, uh, to rent out April 1st. We closed on it February 8th, renovated it and we rented it out April 1st. So it was fairly fast in, in that process. Um, so we, we wanted someone to come in on the first, we didn't know if it would be, be possible. So like March 20, like sixth or whatever, like the week before, um, because we chose the town of Brookhaven, uh, when it comes to section eight, I don't know how I can't prove this, but we got the rental permit like the next day. So whether they called over and said, Hey, where's the rental permit? I can't, I don't know, but <laughs> we like magically got the rental permit back in like six or seven weeks. Wow. Which was like, un- which was like unheard of for Brookhaven. Yeah. It's excellent. Know? So even like my ex it was like, that was, we got it back. That was awesome. And, uh, they literally came out, the guy came out and inspected it for the section eight and the town rental permit all in one shot. So there wasn't like multiple inspections. It was like the guy came once, um, he goes, all right, just fix this and this. I'll come back tomorrow. Got it done. Wow. And we rented the thing out on April 1st. So, uh, we breezed through it. I mean, it was a, it was a lot of work. I mean, my team was great. Um, a rental agent, Carrie like, blew it out of the water. Uh, we got more rent than we thought we'd get. I mean, it was great. So all in all, it was like, you know, such a good, I mean, listen, there was ups and downs, but all in all, it was a good thing. Like we rented it, we refinanced, we got a lot of our money back. Um, it's making good cash flow. Like I said, there's an equity component. Uh, it was just really fun and really exciting. So I'm, I'm excited to do it again. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah. That's, and that seems pretty rare. You know, you had one inspector come in and, and bang out both of them, which is great. You know, I wish, I wish it was like that. Brookhaven will do that. If you're doing like this, if obviously you need to run the permit, right? So they, they're the ones doing it and they'll do that. If you're doing them, uh, using them for section eight too. Like if you're doing CDC, obviously there's two different parties. So they're going to have separate inspections. Mm-hmm. But, um, if it's just them, you could tell them to come out just the one time and they should do that. They did it for me. Gotcha. Yeah, that's nice. And then I've had some that are on DSS social services and that's another inspection. So it could be two or three inspections yeah. just to get. Paid. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you got the permit properties renovated. And then now you have to find a tenant. So tenant screening, I think you said your, your agent is excellent with that, right? Yeah. So I rely a a big chunk on my rental agent. Um, you know, I think, I think also because we have mutually, uh, our interests are mutually aligned, right? Because, you know, if she gives me a bad, uh, tenant, she's not, let's just be honest, like, I might not consider using her for the next one, right? I mean, she can't, listen, I, I, obviously you can't control the tenant, but she like, she's got like a secret sense and she kind of knows like, yeah, this one's pretty good. You might want to go with this. Like she loved the tenant that, that we chose and I love her too. She's a great tenant. Okay. Um, but uh, so she's I a little street savvy. Oh dude. Yeah. She's street smart. Like I would never like in this area, 
that we are that I'm renting when and she really knows the area. Yeah. I'm not gonna use anyone else to rent out my units just because I think she's street smart. She's gonna pick a good tenant. Uh she's been doing this for twenty or thirty years. Um she knows the business. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I would even recommend it to other people. I was telling other landlords that, you know, are like, Oh, I'm looking for someone to rent out X, Y, and Z. I'm like, just call Carrie. Just call Carrie. All your problems are solved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, all right. So I'm glad to hear that. And um, so now going forward, uh, as far as property management, do you do that? Do you hire somebody or how does that work? No, I, I manage everything myself. Um, I'll take the calls. Not that there are many of them, but we've had a couple so far. And I take the calls myself and deal with any of the issues. Um, I've had issues where like a contractor has to go out there and fix something. So it happens. I mean, not that this is like, this isn't set it and forget it. I think a lot of people think that. Yeah, they like, think it's just think, oh. such a passive income type of business, but it's... Exactly. No, and it is. It kind of is. It is mailbox money. Like I get, like they deposit the money right into my account. And I also have the, the mortgage on auto pay. Like it's just, it's some months I, don't, I do nothing. I just sit back yeah. and, collect, and collect money. It's great. But <clears throat> there's definitely times when you have to like, you know, deal with problems. Um, so people, like, like I said, like people think they're going to get into this business and just have like this, this, you know, empire of like, oh, I'm going to sit on the beach and just like own real estate and make money and not have to work. And it's like, that is, that is the complete opposite in my <laughs> view. Like I've worked my ass off and I only yeah, have yeah. one rental so far, but like, this is not people like, it's like what I'm trying to say is like people get in this business thinking they can, like not have to work. And it's like, no, you have to work so yeah. hard in this business. This is such a hard business. Yeah. So because you're 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 building equity and you're building wealth, you know, it's all it's definitely worth it, but it's definitely not passive. Like they, they make it seem to be. Yeah. Oh yeah, like all these like YouTube videos and stuff. I think it does a disservice to it it, it sets up people's reality or perception to think that's the reality. And yeah. It's, the, it's not the reality. I mean, it's, it's such hard, it's such a hard business. Um, it's kind of like, you know, you eat what you kill. Like you really got to like put in so much work and develop relationships with people. Uh, because let's be honest, who's going to just like give Joe Schmo a deal, you know, who just entered this business like three months ago. Yeah. No, you have to like create, you have to create your opportunities and that's hard, especially in a competitive market that we're, that we're in, in Long Island. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on Long Island in this market, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely challenging. Yeah. So um so like so what's next? You you still looking for deals, you know, have you have you found it a little more difficult right now or are things easing up and um a little bit of both. I think I'm definitely looking for more deals. Uh, I have one, maybe two in the pipeline that uh not in the pipeline where I've gotten accepted offer, but I think I might be close on a couple. Um I've been putting in offers, you know, as the market has changed, as interest rates have changed, uh, my offers have also changed. So that's kind of like, you know, it's, we're at this point where, you know, I'm, we're not really getting many deals just because the numbers are changing. So I'm offering lower and people listen, the comps haven't, haven't gotten lower yet. So yeah, the, the lower your offer is the less chance you have at a deal. So yeah, it's and- been at this like weird time where it's like, it's, we're putting in offers, but it's not, nothing's really biting. Yeah, it's definitely a weird time. You know, you can tell something's going on. You know, it's just uh, it's not there yet. But you know, real estate takes time. It's not uh, it's not an overnight thing. A shift like this is going to take a little bit. Yeah, you know, but you can yeah, sense no, it. You can sense that something's going to shift. Yeah, I think I think things will shift, but it, it's going to take it takes time. Like th- things don't happen. Like people, I think there's a poll. Like eighty seven percent of people think we're in like um, not that we're in recession, but like that the market's going to crash or something, but that's just not the reality. Mm-hmm. The markets don't move like that. It's not the stock market moves like that maybe, but the, the real estate market takes time. So this might take a year before we even see things actually cooling down it, as far as closed sales. I mean, obviously buyers are a little hesitant to, you know, come into the market because the interest rates change, but things are still selling. And you know, that's what people got to realize just because a hundred people aren't, putting an offer at your house, maybe only five are, but it's closing. You only need one buyer. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the people like, you know, the past year or so, two years, they've been seeing, you know, 50 people outside their open house when that's just not realistic, you know, before that, you know, it's, even if you have, you know, a line, you know, it's still going to sell, you know, 
it's just not as crazy as it was. Maybe it's back to normal, but yeah, no, and I, and I like, um, I, I mean, I like it as an investor because the last yeah. few years we got into this business at like the the worst time because it was so hard to get a deal. It was so competitive. We mm -hmm. had like no deals that we're fighting between me and, and 20 other investors are fighting between such small amounts of inventory, you know, in that price range that we were all looking at, you know, yeah. cause the prices exploded. So now I think with the exchange, it, it just opens up more opportunity because there'll be more homes priced in that, in that range that we're looking to buy things at. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. Yeah. It's going to make it, you know, fun again to yeah. run out there running for deals and, and, and negotiating and things like that. Yeah, because I mean, I, I love it. Like I did my what my first deal, and that whole process to me was so much fun. Like buying the property, closing on it, renovating it, finding a tenant, renting it out, refinancing it, and then just renting it. You know, yeah, like the burst strategy. Like that was fun. To me. That's it. Yeah, I, th those three months or two months or whatever it was, were, like really fun. And um, I just want to do it again. It was a lot of fun. So I want to keep doing it and just kind of build up my portfolio. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So like, what are you doing to find deals and to, to look for deals and things like that? Um, I'm doing, obviously the networking is, is key. I mean, I think that's going to be the most powerful, you know, way of getting deals. Um, that's how I got the deal. Uh, my first deal, um, just networking. I, I would say, um, also the SM, I'm doing like SMS texting. So like, that's something I'm trying to go after the, the deal on its own, like, uh, you know, where I'm one where I'm not competing with a thousand people. Yeah. Right. Like I am, like I am with the MLS. Um, and then also like a lot of, you gotta realize like the network is great, but a lot of these deals that I'm getting are, are, are like, you know, whether they're wholesalers or a realtor, they're not, there's less meat on the bone than if I was going after the source itself. Yeah. You know, so I, that's why I want to implement the SMS or some kind of, uh, cold calling slash SMS where, uh, I'm going after the homeowner and getting, you know, hopefully the better deal. Um, yeah. More personal direct to seller. Do you send, do you send videos or voice memos or just text? No, the, the video text was like with the realtors. I do that with realtors. Okay. Um, so I sent them like some like video of me and introduce myself. And I mean, that's been great. I've gotten deals that way, but, um, uh, this directly to the homeowner is just like a generic, like, Hey, uh, I see you own one, two, three main street. Are you interested in selling or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Nice. And, and I'm doing like a mass, I have like a system for it. So I'm doing like a mass texting and it's all about numbers. You know, you're not going to text like 30 people and expect a deal. You know, I, I have a list of like 10,000 and I'm just going through each one, you know? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It's just consistency and volume when it comes to, you know, something like that or direct mail and things like that. That's all marketing is. It's, it's, it's being consistent. Right. Like, like I ran through the first list of 10,000, I got some leads, but I don't have a deal yet. So it, most people I've been doing this for like two months. People would quit after this two, three months and say, ah, it doesn't work. You gotta do it for like six months. You gotta do it for like a year. Yeah. Yeah. A deal. Yeah. Yeah. So like, that's the reality. It's just, a, it's a, it's a numbers game. So you gotta do a, you know, big list, do two big lists. And then you just keep doing it and following up. Yep. Good. That's, that's good. All right. So let's, um, let's jump into taxes, things like that. So, you know, we all heard the word depreciation, um, you know, being such a powerful tax tool for investors. So for somebody who's just doesn't exactly know what, what it is, you know, just, can you just explain it, you know, as far as, as far as real estate investing? Yeah, so uh, depreciation is uh, the IRS allows you to uh, depreciate uh, the building that you bought. Like, so you bought a, a house, a single family house. Um, obviously, there's land and building. Can't depreciate the land. Uh, but the building component, you can depreciate over, uh, if it's a single family house, it's 27 and a half years. Um, if it's a, like, a commercial property, it's going to be 39 years. So, um, and all it is, is essentially you take the purchase price or the building component, divide it by the, the amount of years. And each year that's a deduction on your tax return against your rental income, right? So let's just say, for example, it's 10,000 a year. 
uh, and you're making, let's say you're making 15,000 a year in rental income, but you have 10,000 depreciation, um, you're going to report 5,000. Uh, well, I'm sure you have other expenses in there too, but uh, throw, putting that aside for a second, yeah, yeah, it's just it's just a way, you know, in that example, you're able to shield in that example ten thousand dollars of rental income uh, that you're not going to have to pick up as a, as you know income on your tax return, right? So it's just a way to kind of shield income uh, legally, you know, against your your income, um, and then what happens is. You know, it's it's kind of like a loan though, because what happens is when you sell it, you sell the rental property or you sell the investment, you have to pay back the depreciation. It's called depreciation recapture. Uh, so that's why it's not always beneficial to sell. You kind of everyone likes to keep the properties uh, for as long as possible and do if you have to sell, do like a ten thirty one exchange. Yeah, exactly. So let, that's a perfect segue. So let's talk about 1031 exchanges, you know, for somebody who's read it in a book or on Google, you know, what exactly is it? Yeah, so a 1031 exchange is just a, it's a like kind exchange, you know, and that's what the IRS defines it as. Um, as if you sell a, uh, it has to be a real estate, it can't be a stock or bonds or anything. So let's talk about real estate only. Um, if you sell a property, like it has to be for investment or business use. Can't be your personal house. Can't be anything like that. If you sell a rental property or a business property, you're able to defer the gains on that property if you buy another property or a replacement property um, within. Uh, you have to identify it within 45 days, and you have to close on it within six months or 180 days. So if you if you meet that criteria of replacing the property with another property. You can then defer any gains that you would have paid uh, until, you know, it, essentially until you die if you, if you keep that property. So that's that's great because you don't have to pay taxes on it now. And then ultimately, what happens is when you die with that with that property, your heirs take the step up basis in the property. So the step up basis at your death is the fair market value. So meaning you kind of defer that gain forever and then it gets wiped out when you die. Exactly. Yeah. That's nice. And I know it was on the table with the government. They were thinking about getting rid of it and things like that, but nothing, nothing with that. Right. No, they just passed it recently. Like, like yesterday, two days ago, okay. um, that, that was not included. The 1031, they talked about it, but the, I was actually reading, there wasn't much changes from, from a tax perspective, like from a code tax code perspective. Okay. There were some things, but nothing that was like, like there was like the carried interest, which is more of like hedge funds it had nothing to do with us. Um, but from real estate perspective, there was nothing. Okay. So that's good. They didn't, which is good. Like we all, yeah. we all were like freaking out. Like they're going to, these people, they're, they're going to change the, this, that, and the other thing. And I guess the real estate lobby must've, you know, kept it the way it was. They did, they did their job and kept it the way it is because, that would have been that would have been like that would have changed everything. Oh yeah, you know I, I know investors like I do work for investors as a, from a tax side, and their whole business is built around doing ten thirty one exchanges. Like they they buy a property, they sell it, you know, for millions of dollars more than what they bought it for, and they just buy a replacement property and don't pay any taxes. Wow, so, yeah, it, yeah, it's great. Like they utilize the tax code to not pay taxes, which is I guess good and bad. But I can tell you right now, though, that if they didn't do it, I mean, that's a big part of the, the economy. If all these people aren't doing 1031 exchanges, you know, your commercial markets would, would be destroyed. And, and uh, that's a big part of the economy. So there's like a whole trickle down effect to it, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, that, that's why real estate is such a powerful tool for like shielding taxes and paying your taxes and things like that. You're not doing anything illegal or anything like that. It's just... That's what it's for. Yeah, because like, like, let's like the way they designed the tax code was was really to stimulate the economy or incentivize people to do things that are good for the economy. Exactly, and that's how it was set up. And like, like I think I think our our economy is like 40, 40 or fifty percent of our economy is like all goes back to real estate. So if you start telling people they can't do ten thirty one exchanges and the commercial markets like they they suffer. I mean, you're gonna, we're going to go into a recession. There's no question about that. It's like, 
So people want to say, oh, well, yeah, this is horrible. They're not paying taxes. It's like, okay, you want you want them to pay taxes? Well, you're going to be in like a really bad recession. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, both ways. So yeah, that's what they do. They, they incentivize, they try to incentivize us through means like depreciation and other things that, you know, you want people to buy real estate that, and there's a lot of benefits to do it. Yeah. And uh, it obviously helps the country. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as buying real estate, what about different, um, different legal entities, LLCs, S corps, you know, rentals, flips, things, things like that. Yeah. So, um, I always tell people like what I do is, um, I have an S corp set up for, for me. Uh, and that's really to, to, to do, if I do flips, I'm going to, all the profits will go into the S corp. And also it, I receive uh, like a management fee for my rentals <clears throat> that will go right into my S corp. So I keep that uh, set up for any kind of operational income. And then on the passive side, which is on the rental real estate side, uh, I just created a single member LLC. So the property isn't an LLC and it's protected, but all that means is that it gets reported on my individual tax return. So it gets reported on Schedule E. Um, most, most people don't know what that is, but it really just means single member LLC just means it's not a tax entity. It's not like there's no tax return for that LLC. It just gets reported at a higher level. Ultimately, in this case, it's reported on my individual tax return. So uh, I know that's confusing, uh, but rentals, I would, I would say like getting back to the operational stuff and the passive stuff, I would not recommend people putting rental properties in, in S corps or anything like that. Because you don't want to combine passive income with, you know, other income like flips that, that could be subject to self-employment taxes or whatever. You know, just keep them separate. So, yeah, definitely. Um, That's the yeah. key, keeping things separate. Um, yeah, how, many properties do you, how many properties do you keep in an LLC? Do you, do you do one per house or do you, do you put three in an LLC? Yeah, I don't like the, I don't like the multi. Uh, some people just have like one LLC and it holds all their rentals. And I don't like to do that. Um, I like to do a separate LLC for each property and, you know, I'll even go as far as having a separate bank account for each property. Now, a lot of people definitely won't do that, but I just like separate books and records for each property. And then from a legal, like liability perspective, I want each LLC on its own because if there's ever like a lawsuit, something fall, whatever. Yeah, sure. I'm sure it's great. Uh, so hopefully it'll never come back to me, but I always wondered, and I think this is the case, like you're, you're, you're only shielded from the LLC. So the assets in that LLC can be, can be, I don't know, can go, go after if there was ever some major lawsuit. So I don't, I don't know. I just wouldn't like to put that on all those rentals into an LLC. God forbid something happens, you know, can all your, can all your rentals be taken from you? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I have uh, to an attorney, talk to an attorney. Don't <laughs> talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, each property has its own LLC, you know, because like you just said, you know, if you have three properties in an LLC, something happens at one of them, they can go after the other two in that one. Yeah. You know, whether. Yeah. So why put yourself in that position? Yeah. When you just have a clean, you know, one LLC per, prop, per, prop, per property and just, just leave it at that. Yeah. Exactly what I do. Um, and what about just different, you know, uh, deductions and, you know, keeping track of your business, your day-to-day -day things and things like that. Like what well, people come to you at, at the end of the year, should they come to you at once a year or sh do you like when people like check in with you quarterly or things like that? Yeah, it, it depends. Yeah. So I think you definitely should talk to your accountant more than once a year. Um, Cause if someone comes to me and they just give me their stuff and say, Hey, can you prep my return? Um, depending on your, your job, but you could owe money. Right. Um, I know people that they make money in the schedule C, they might be a realtor, whatever, and they don't pay any estimated taxes throughout the year. They come to me at the end of the year and you all, you owe all this money. So like, that's not my fault, you know, and then it, it puts me in a bad position too. Yeah. And I, I got to be like, dude, you owe like 20 grand. Like, what do you mean I owe 20 grand? It's like, you didn't pay any taxes. So, uh, it sucks. So I kind of tell people, especially people like that, I'll, one, I'll give them estimates, like, I'll give them stuff to pay throughout the year. Uh, but, but even even so, like if you make more than what I'm projecting in your estimate, 
you're still going to owe money. So you got to always, whether it's three times a year or twice a year, like always talk to your accountant and give them an update on uh, what you're making like or how you're making. You're doing well this year. You're not doing as well. Uh, and then I can adjust your estimates going forward. And then you could, you could pay everything in. Yeah, definitely. And as as far as the estimates, you know, you can end up paying a little more. But if those estimates are more and you've been paying more than what you actually owe, does that just get rolled over to next year, or do you get a little refund, or either? Both. Yeah, it's like um, it, yeah. If you have an over, if you have a refund, you can you can you tell me, and I'll either give you the refund back, or I could say keep it in for next year. Um, if you're like someone like that who's paying quarterly estimates, a lot of times I just roll them forward i mean it, it's up to you right ultimately i'm going to do what you say as the client but um it's always good to keep them rolling forward because then you don't have to keep paying those quarterlies maybe maybe if i roll them forward maybe you only have to pay three quarterlies you know yeah exactly. first quarterly is taken care of in the in the refund or, or i should say the the the, the prepayments mm -hmm. and then you just keep paying like the next quarter you know so i think it, it really depends on your preference i, I like that idea you know, you're on track of it and you have an idea of what the end of the year is going to look like. Yeah. But if you're like, if you're like an individual who has a W2 job, that, then yeah, you're just going to take the money back. I'm not giving them money. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just straightforward. And, um, yeah. So, um, let's just, start, let's start to wrap this up a little bit. So where do you see yourself in say five years from now? Um, Certainly going to keep, you know, doing the, the accounting and taxes and stuff like that. That's always fun. Um, you know, I'm a CPA too, so, you know, I'm not going to stop doing, you know, what I, I do love, you know, accounting, but um, it's just really to grow my real estate business as well. Um, I want to continue to buy, you know, multiple rental properties each year uh, and just try to grow that business and then maybe get into flipping uh, at some point, maybe, maybe 2023 three at the earliest okay um and just try to because you know a lot of times a, a lot of these deals and i even in the rental markets that i'm looking at they're not going to be rental properties they're going to be most likely a flip type of a, a property yeah for a lot of for a lot of different reasons you know um so for me to pass on that should, would be foolish so i should be able to position myself where i'm capitalizing on a lot of different things like flips like flipping and and, uh, and plus, you listen, I get a lead sometimes in, in, in other areas that might be a really good deal, but they're just never going to make sense from a rental perspective. Yeah, I agree. So, so then you, yeah, there's always an outlet flipping, wholesaling, you know, might as well take yeah, advantage monetize, of it. Monetize mm -hmm. those leads if you can. So I, I want to be in a position like where I'm a better investor, where I can, you know, capitalize on a lot of these, a lot of these things, even take them down myself. Yeah. Um, and that's really where I see myself is just growing the business, getting more leads, getting more deals and, you know, trying to make, um, get a, like one, get a lot more rentals. That's number one, but also take on more flips too and make some good money. Yeah. It's fun. I like the process. It's not, it's not a job to me. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. Um, what are some hobbies outside of, uh, outside of your business? <laughs> Um, there aren't any, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it used to be, it used to be like golf. I used to like golfing. Um, I just, I don't have time anymore. Yeah. You know? Um, well, one with obviously having a family, like any other spare time is spent, you know, there. Um, but then, but just like the reality of starting this business, it's so such a hard business. Um, you don't have time. You shouldn't have time to be doing anything leisurely. Let's let's be completely honest. <laughs> and if you do have free time, you're not working hard enough in your business. Yeah. You know, you really shouldn't. I mean, listen, of course, you're going to do some things up, family stuff, whatever. But the point is, like, all of my – I've sacrificed all my hobbies. You know, I used to have time. I used to hang out with my friends all the time. And I still do. Not as much, though. Um, go to concerts. Uh, go golfing. Whatever. That's all out the window. You know, all that's gone. So, and that's what it takes. It takes really just sacrificing certain things in your life um, for, you know, the benefit of, you know, what I want. I wanted this, you know, I wanted real estate. So I know what it, it sacrificed a lot to get there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it'll, it'll all be worth it. You know, I, I just, I'm, and 
be, I'm not even at the level where I want to be, but I am at a level where I've already gone through one property. I know how hard this is like to get where I've gotten. And like I said, I'm still at the beginning, but it's like, it's so hard to start in this business, that momentum. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you're pushing that big boulder, right? And you try to push it down the hill. And that's what really what it's like. It's like, it's so hard to get the boulder going. Yeah. But once you can get it down the hill and it picks up momentum and then everything kind of flows and then you just kind of grow. That's kind of how this business is. Yeah, it's so true. It's, it's very difficult. And just to get things like, just to get things going. And I want to, if I could inspire anyone, particularly in our group, you know, because I know there's a lot of like newer investors in that group. Yeah. And that's, that's what I always got to tell them. It's like, don't worry about the LLC. I have people calling me about LLCs and, you know, they want to be these real estate investors. Like, yes. Dude, dude, please don't even focus on an LLC right now. And mm -hmm. I'm an accountant. I'm telling you that. It's just like uh, my buddy Greg Helbeck says this. It's mental masturbation. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it, it feels good. Like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm getting yeah. stuff done in my business. But you're not. The real thing you should be doing is what's uncomfortable. And that's talking to sellers directly or meeting new people and going to networking events where you have no idea. You don't, you don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. You just got to meet people and getting out of your comfort zone. That's what you should be doing. Yeah. But what you're doing is you think you're doing the right thing by going and opening up an LLC and having the bank account and um, doing like, Oh, I'm setting up my team. So you're like interviewing and that's, you should set up your team. I'm not saying you should, but if you're doing things that are making you comfortable, like, you got to do these things that are, the things that are making you uncomfortable and that's yeah. how you grow. And that's what you have. That's what you should be doing. Yep. Shouldn't waste your, your time and energy, you know, on all that stuff that you can do, that you can do later, you know, once you get the deal and once you get your feet wet and experience and things like that. Yeah. And listen, like, you know, you definitely should build a team. I'm not saying don't do that, but, um, that, that shouldn't even take you that long. I mean, I, I set my team up and like, you know, I had my mortgage guy, set up pretty early on. I use them on my personal residence. So okay. um, we just had like an hour conversation about how this is going to work in the business. Uh, the attorney, again, use them on my personal residence. And he's also, he works with a lot of other real estate investors. He's really good. Um, the contractor took some time. That's going to take time. You should definitely try to find a contractor. That's going to take time to, to get the right guy. But a lot of this stuff is very easy. Insurance guy takes you a couple phone calls. I mean, after the team set up, you really got to just focus on what is important. And that's building a network, uh, trying to find deals either on market, off market, uh, learn, learn what a good deal is. So get the proper education, right? Like learn like what a good deal in the market you're looking at is. And if you don't know that, that's step one. You shouldn't be putting in offers, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, especially if you haven't done any deals before and you're just looking to jump in, you know, you can only build your team so much because you don't really know what you like and don't like. So your team's never going to be perfect until you start to do deals and renovations and deal with tenants and things like that. And then you just, you know, you just adjust along the way. Yeah. And I always tell people they, the, about, about the perfect thing. Like a lot of people are like, well, I got to do this, this, and this before I can do the business stuff. It's like, well, listen, you're waiting for the, the stars to be aligned. That's never going to happen. You know, you got to get into the game now because, uh, and whether it, and maybe you're like, I'm not ready because I'm really truly not ready to buy deals. That's fine. But like I said about the momentum thing, I know how much momentum this business takes to, to get started and to get deals. And even if you're not ready to get a deal right now, you can at least start building the momentum, mm -hmm. get your name out there, uh, let people see who you are. Oh, I, I know about this guy, Mike. Okay. I've seen him around for six months, a year now. He's, he's, a, he's the real thing. Like I met him, we had coffee. You know, the, those are the types of things you, you got to be doing now, uh, even if you're not truly ready to buy, you know? Yeah. And, and, if, and if a deal comes to you, you can always, you know, take it to an investor that you know, like, you know, and you could join venture or, or just wholesale it or whatever. But yeah, you, you got to get, you got to start doing things like, like you said, building your network is very important. Yeah. Building those relationships, you know, those partnerships and just yourself, educating yourself for, you know, when those deals start do start to come in. Yeah. Yeah. Getting educated is important because mm -hmm. uh, like I said, if you don't know what a good deal is, um, you shouldn't be putting in an offer. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, do you have a, you know, then a good business book, a good recommendation for anybody? Um, there's a 
bunch. I mean, I, what, what got me started, got me hooked, was uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, I'm sure everyone I'm sure knows got that a lot one. of people. Yeah, the um, uh, Think and Grow Rich was another mindset book that was really cool. I like that one. Mm -hmm. um, business book, the E Myth was good. E Myth is good. Yeah, they, they have a bunch of good one. Out. Yeah, um, real estate one. Carl gave me one. It was like emerging uh, emerging real estate markets. I think it was called. Um, that was a really good one too, because you get to see like the different cycles of the real estate market, and, yeah. And each one you can make money in, mm -hmm. and it's just it's just you gotta have different strategies, of course, but you can make money in every single market, and you, you just gotta know like what market cycle you're in, yep. and where we're going, and how to position yourself accordingly. Yeah, I love that. But other than that, I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, that's. That's plenty. <laughs> well, uh, well, I appreciate you jumping on here, Mike, you know. Um, Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch and, you know, I'll see you soon. Yeah, bro. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks.